Well, uh, to start with, I didn't really make these slides. I stole them from Wendy, because Wendy is, I think, the only person who's actually taught this unit. Is there anybody else who actually did it? Uh, it's uh, uh, Unit 22, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, Hal Varian's uh, having asymmetric information at Chapter 36. Maybe it doesn't get taught. But uh, this is what it looks like, and these are really uh, a combination of Wendy and my uh, um, efforts. Um, uh, our, our objective here is to lay out this, uh, this unit. Um, this unit has been through many different iterations. We've tried, and many people, uh, Suresh Naidu, uh, Tim Besley, Wendy, and uh, I, and others have uh, had, it's over three years now. This is its current iteration, uh, and it will probably change in response to comments that you have. So we, have, we do have the opportunity to, um, uh, to move this thing along. I, I'm going to give an e overview in about eight or ten slides. Uh, Humberto is then going to give a, um, you know, we asked him to do a critique when, uh, uh, but uh, he said such nice things about us. I, Humberto, I hope you can come up with uh, something a, l a little more, you know, mm, um, uh, for this, uh, this stuff, and I'm sure he can. Uh, this is, after all, one of the fields he works in, so I'm sure we can look forward to some good criticisms. Uh, so that's, that's our objective. Um, uh, the, um, I want to uh, claim something uh, here. This, chap this is the first opening lines of the chapter, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, as the leader of the anti-apartheid movement, as the uh, head of NUM, the National Union of uh, Mine Workers. Uh, and um, we, uh, so it, it was, an, and he was, of course, uh, not, not a very well-known figure when the first core uh, uh, issue was put out. It was circulated widely in South Africa. And uh, so as a result of the exposure that Ramaphosa had because of being circulated by CORE, he's now, as you probably know, become the president of South Africa. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you'll see this, uh, there are a number of predictions which we make here that have actually come, come true. Um, the, um, uh, to put in context of what we're doing here, uh, in the upper left, uh, you'll see what is a constitution, a written constitution of a pirate ship. I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. Uh, but we use that to introduce the idea of institutions as rules of the game. Uh, so obviously, uh, the, um, uh, 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 dealing with the government, we have to deal with a rather special kind of a, an institution. Uh, we had the feeling that in Unit uh, 12, we spend a lot of time on government solving market failure problems. And throughout the book, in fact, we have a lot of policy applications. And the government comes in more or less you know, on a, on a white horse or something and solves the problem. And we know that that isn't always the case uh, and that there are problems. So uh, one of the things we're trying to do in this unit is to correct the imbalance, which we couldn't really avoid. Because if you deal with, well, this is a problem that could be solved by Piguvian taxes or what kind of subsidies, you're never raising the question how likely is that to happen? Uh, so one of the things we're trying to do here is um, that. Um, but in any case, we've so far set the stage in the previous chapters that uh, institutions are important, government's one of them, uh, and uh, that government uh, can uh, play crucial roles uh, in solving um, market failures and ensuring fairness. Um, so we want to say what's unique about the government as an actor. We want to say how it works, that is, what does it do? Uh, we want to talk about why some institutions and policies are chosen and not others. Having said institutions are important throughout the, uh, the course, we want to say something about how institutions change. Why do we have uh, different kinds of institutions? Um, the, uh, um, of course, uh, governments are part of the solution. The students have already been uh, trained in that, but uh, they're also uh, part of the problem. Uh, and there are limits intrinsic to uh, any economy, but specific kinds of limits intrinsic to a capitalist economy in what the state can do, and we'd like students to understand uh, some, of, some of that. Uh, and we want to look finally at what is the effect of a democratic political uh, system uh, on how the institutions work. Um, so beginning with the economic actor, uh, the government as an economic actor, um, uh, we want to persuade the students that government's really important. It's half the economy in a lot of the leading uh, economies, and it doesn't really get half the pages in most of your intro textbooks, and it doesn't in ours either, but we give it a bit, a bit more attention. Uh, before I go on, look at that figure. Uh, 
Core has been praised all over the place I mean, for years now because of the quality of the pre presentation of our data. That began with David Hope. David, thank you for that. I don't know where you got such a way of producing these things. I mean, you really have a great sense of how to make a graph look really scientific and kind of plausible. <laughs> 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 no, also, David, David was the one who got us started on making sure that every figure like this, we have an Excel file uh, formatted in a similar way so that you, these, e these easily can be used. And Eileen has now taken over to doing, uh, doing that. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the, the core data sets are so, so valuable. Um, now, uh, so we established that government has some unique properties. Uh, this is a definition which is said to come from Weber, but I happen to know that Weber got it from Trotsky, uh, which is that the government is the only body in society which can legitimately exercise coercion over the, over the territory in which it operates, including restraints on an individual's freedom in order to, uh, to um, pursue those ends. Uh, of course, we have uh, uh, the governments as part of the um, solution, um, and we talk a lot uh, in previous chapters on how this can be done. We, we review those things in this unit, although not in great detail. Notice we include not just incentives, regulation, and public provision, but also uh, persuasion and information, because one of the government, uh, governments have a huge effect on people's public preferences, and uh, we think that's part of what governments do. As part of the problem, um, uh, the very simple fact is that uh, anybody powerful enough to address uh, market failures and, and address problems of unfairness is also powerful enough to cause a lot of problems. There's no way around that. That is, governments have to be empowered to do things and to be coercive in, in some ways. For example, coercing people to partic participate in some universal insurance scheme. Uh, but any, anything that powerful is uh, also potentially a problem. We lay out some of the ways that in liberal democratic societies this problem has been addressed uh, either through democratic elections uh, uh, and through constitutional limits on what governments can do. Uh, we, we, uh, so the, we, we have a, a model then of a government then operating under constraints. And guess what that's like? It's just like the slides that Wendy showed you before. There's going to be a feasible set, and there's going to be some indifference curves, and the students have now seen this seven or eight or nine times. Uh, Umberto is going to lay out what that model's like and have a few words to say about it. Um, now, having laid out this problem, the, you know, the government as a rent-seeking problem, uh, uh, we then want to say, well, how have uh, various societies dealt with this? Uh, and uh, obviously, um, um, one of the ways uh, that this is done is through the spread of democracy. Our interpretation of this, which we think is uh, correct historically, at least in the countries that became liberal democracies uh, in the last century, um, that is, with the growing inequalities associated with the expansion of the capitalist system under undemocratic uh, political rule, autocratic, that is with very limited suffrage and so on, uh, there became uh, you know, serious pressures, uh, social unrest and so on, so that th this kind of growth in wealth inequalities, again a beautiful, pic uh, be beautiful picture, uh, was eventually associated with the advance of democracy. We have a strong and I think correct definition of democracy as including not only civil liberties but also virtually universal suffrage. Uh, the, re the, the dates, most people are very surprised that democracy is such a new phenomenon and that's because people think the French Revolution brought democracy to France, uh, which of course has been good, nothing of the kind occurred because as you can see suffrage was limited in these places uh, to uh, usually the people with property, certainly women, sometimes ethnic minorities uh, and so on. So democracy is a recent phenomenon and it had, we believe, substantial effects on how the capitalist system works. One of those effects is on what governments spend their money on. Uh, that is, if you look back to the figure of the uh, size of the UK government, uh, there, in the past, in, it, it, the, the governments were large during wartime, but they got small during peacetime. And after the Second World War, that didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, this, this gives you some idea of what the, the vast differences and the kinds of things governments spend money on, uh, also in how big the government is compared to the rest of GDP. Uh, we're trying to give students a, a sense of this, this actor and its importance. Uh, having defined democracy, however, we want to give people a, a sense also that there are different kinds of democracies. 
Um, there, and if, if we could write uh, two by two tables on, uh, you know, in three dimensions, uh, so we could have two by two by twos, we would want to uh, uh, it, um, extend this. But we, here we identify basically two characteristics of what we call democratic accountability, um, that governments are dismissed uh, if they uh, don't win elections, uh, and, they're not, and the second is they're not dismissed for any other reason, um, and they don't come to power for any other reason. Uh, and once again, so we have here examples of these uh, various kinds of political systems, Germany and so on. And once again, we predicted uh, what would happen in Italy a month ago when the president, who has no authority to really do this, decided he could not accept a party which had won an election and formed an electoral coalition because uh, the president didn't like the political views of the proposed minister of finance, a truly extraordinary intervention in the democratic process. However much I happen to agree with the president's views of the uh, Cinque Stelle uh, minister of finance uh, in question. So, uh, we predicted that Italy would show up as a only slightly democratic state. That's now been reversed. You know Cinque Stelle and La Lega are now uh, the government of Italy. Um, uh, we have a series of exercises on democracy makes a difference. And we do this in part as part of our ongoing training in the students of how do you use data to, to come to conclusions uh, which can be associated with causal statements. Uh, and there are a number of interesting studies, uh, but uh, uh, one which we use because it is, is such a neat natu a natural experiment was women's suffrage in the United States came at various different times because of the different states. I mean, people are surprised at this, but voting rights differ dramatically from state to state in the United States. Uh, and it provided a nice example to see what effect women having the vote would have on who was elected and the policies they pursued. This is a wonderful example, by the way, of how core uh, grows because of its use. Uh, Wendy and I were in Lahore, Pakistan, where they'd been using it for a while, and um, uh, one of the people teaching it at Lahore um, University of Management Science says, said we ought to really look at this example, so we plugged it right in. Uh, and what, so, or there's again the famous Esther Duflo uh, and co-author study of the randomization of villages in West Bengal in which the uh, panchayats, that is village councils, uh, had to have uh, uh, a minimum amount of female participation and uh, a third of them had to have female heads of the sarpanch or the head of the panchayat had to be a female, uh, looking at the effect of that. So once again, this is involving the students in interesting aspects of politics, in this case politics and women's representation, but also in the methods of natural experiments. Uh, the, um, uh, we talk about government failure um, in terms of the limits on what governments can do and do do. Uh, I think we have to admit that we're not really happy with the term government failure. Uh, it's popular in the literature and it's a nice contrast to, I mean, it's a nice companion to market failure. It can't really be defined in the same way because uh, I think we call government failures many things additional to simply not implementing a Pareto uh, efficient outcome. Uh, but we use the term nonetheless. And here are some of the reasons why we think about governments uh, failing. Uh, the, um, of course, we talk a little, not a whole lot, on special interests, uh, but also structural constraints. And uh, we use an example, um, one which Camila will be uh, familiar with, this is uh, the Santiago stock market uh, in the days leading up to the election of Salvador Allende in 1970. Uh, this was a very unexpected election. We, I mean, oh, this is a nice case. I was working on producing this graph for this chapter, for this unit, and uh, with, a, with a friend. And this wasn't a paper. I mean, was just, there was no, we were just making a graph. And the graph got to be so interesting that we decided, hey, why, why don't we submit this to a journal? And it, and it got published. Uh, so, I mean, that's, it usually goes the other way, right? First you do the research, and then it shows up in the intro text. Well, in this case, uh, it, it started here. Um, so, we, you know, we asked the students to think about what they can learn from a graph like that. What would they have to know to treat this as causal and so on? And this is after the coup, which uh, uh, eliminated the uh, Allende regime and uh, uh, put... Uh, Pinochet in the, uh, as head of state. Uh, to, to conclude, um, uh, there are a number of things we would like students to take away that, um, 
That is, having told them that institutions are important, we want to get them some sophistication in thinking about how political uh, processes uh, affect the evolution of these institutions. Uh, these institutions and the political processes which account for them both affect the size of the pie and the, how, the, how the pie is divided. Um, uh, we want the students to see that there are constraints on what governments can do. Uh, and also to see how capitalism and dem democracy have evolved together, uh, each affecting the other. And we end uh, with a rather uh, sort of a hopeful statement that uh, the, th these institutions don't just evolve by themselves, they ev evolve because of what people do. Uh, what people do depends on what they know and what they think. They've now studied economics and they can presumably intervene in this process to be part of it, particularly if they don't like the way the institutions are working um, at present. Uh, uh, one last slide, uh, uh, in lunchtime and also before, a number of you have asked about uh, life after core. And uh, I would have, the first thing I would have said is uh, Carlin and Soskis is a fantastic um, macro, intermediate macro textbook. Maybe Wendy, could you say a word about that tomorrow after, uh, maybe when you talk about the macro stuff. Uh, this, is, this book doesn't exist uh, yet. I mean, it's been, it's been taught. It, it's available in an online form in PDF and so on. Uh, it's being test taught and it'll be published next year. Uh, I'd be very happy. Anybody who's interested in having a look at this, send me an email and I will uh, give, you, uh, give you access to a PDF and also uh, information about who else is teaching it in the coming uh, semester. Uh, and so, Humberto, over, over to you. OK, thank you. Uh, so I'm back. Uh, so what they asked me is to talk about, hmm, so to focus on this unit 22, to focus on the, on the models, on the two models, the dictator model and the, the medium bottom model. The idea is that Lucy could give also the, you know, the political science view, hmm, which I was counting on it, and you know, it's, it's a little bit missing uh, in the presentation. But let me just. Hmm, Focus, focus on that. So the idea is, so I'm going to present these two models as the way they are presented in the, in the textbook. Uh, and then I have to say some bad things. Hmm? I'll try to, to excel some, on, both, on, on both ways. OK, so the, the way political uh, model is presented in, in, in the economy, it's, so this graph is not there, but I think it's, it's, it's the way I picture it. It's really the dimensions between a self-dictator and ideal democracy. Hmm? So, the, and, and, and what we are measuring here is the degree of electoral competition. We go from no electoral competition at all, and that could be a selfish hmm, dictator, to an ideal democracy which goes a little bit more than perfect competition. Hmm? So in a way, if we do the parallel, and I think that's, that's the intention of the, of the chapter, if we do the parallel with the economic analysis, we go from monopoly or a collusive cartel to perfect competition. Hmm? It's true that ideal democracy, and that's something that probably needs to, to be refined in the, in the book, ideal democracy is more than just, than just uh, electoral competition. And, and in between, what we would have? Well, we would have oligarchies with political competition. We would have hmm, manhood suffra suffrage. We would have universal suffrage. And then at the end, we would end up hmm, with all the institutions into the idea of, 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 uh, of, of democracy. Uh, so in a way, what we want to describe here is both, hmm, the both extremes, hmm, which is usually the, the, the standard. So we start describing the selfish detector, and then we, we move to the, to, to the democratic. Uh, so Robert, yes. I mean, referring back to your remarks earlier on, it was you, wasn't it, talking about positive versus normative? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. What, 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 just, and what, what do you mean here? I mean, is this normative or is this positive? Uh, so, it's, it's, so, so this is this is positive. Hmm? The way it's, so I, I'm presenting here, so I haven't, in a way, I'm not introducing my, my notes here. Huh? So the first part, I'm describing what is in the text. Hmm? Uh, so that's what I said, that this thing of ideal democracy, let's say, personally, I would write just democracy. Hmm? Uh, and, and the definition, so I, uh, 
in a way, I would, I would, I would distinguish between selfish dictator and perfect uh, electoral competition. Mm? And that could be one of the points, the difference between democracy and electoral competition. Mm? Okay. Uh, so what's, what's the model for the, for the Rensinki, mm? Rensinki di di uh, dictator? So the idea is that there is a selfish di uh, dictator, or, or mm, if you want an homogeneous ruling elite, uh, this is the same as having a monopoly or a collusive cartel, uh, there is a single policy, and the policy is uh, identif identified with, uh, with a tax collected from citizens, and they have to provide an exogenous public service. Okay? This exogenous public service it has to be assumed as the minimum they have to provide in order to not be overthrown, to stay in power. If they provide less than this cost, then they cannot stay in power. Mm? Uh, so this could be, mm, so the way it's described is basic health services or schooling. Mm, I think it's just the idea of what's the minimum mm, that, uh, that needs to be provided uh, to, to stay in power. The dictator wants to obtain political rents, and political rents are the taxes collected in excess of the cost of the public service. So in a way, here it's this rent seeking, is this political, political rents, and what the dictator wants is to maximize the expected rents. Mm? And the expected rents is just the rent per year, which is the difference between what is the tax collected minus this, this uh, minimum cost, times the expected duration, the expected number of years I will be Mm? but the dictator will be in power, okay? But of course, dictators as monopolies, they have constraints. Mm? So if we make the similarity with the monopoly, this could be the price, this could be the marginal cost, and then they will have mm, a demand, mm, the quantity. So here the quantity is the, the expected number, number of years. As the monopolist mm, who would have eh, the constraint of the demand, the dictator, what he has is the constraint of being overthrown, okay? Uh, and this being overthrown, what it, uh, what it says is that this expected duration depends on the tax. Mm? Or in a way that the expected duration depends on what's the, uh, the actions taken by the government. Mm? So there is an exogenous probability that you get overthrown, but there is a part of the duration of your duration in power that depends on what is your particular policy. And that gives as a result, what is the duration curve. Mm? So if we go graphically, what we have, mm, if, we, if we put in the vertical axis total tax revenue and in the horizontal axis the duration, mm, in, uh, number of years in, in power, what we have is a high tax, it will give a high rent per year, but it will probably have a short-lived dictator in power. By establishing a lower, a lower tax, the, uh, the dictator will improve, will increase the number of years in power, and by considering all the combinations, we get what is the, the, du the duration curve, okay? Where we have excluded mm, the cost per year with the idea that mm, that's the maximum that the, uh, the maximum that the dictator can be, can be in power, okay? So what's the other side of the of the problem, the other side is what's, what are the preferences of the dictator mm, in this case, and here mm, I'm assuming that people have seen, or students have already seen the monopoly, which of course, mm, this is just a replica of the, of the analysis. We have the ISO rent curves, which is equivalent to the ISO profits of the monopolies, and the ISO rent curves are all those mm, combinations of taxes and expected duration that gives mm, the same, the same expected, uh, expected rents. Mm? And the shape, of, the shape of the ISO rent curves, mm? that could be to reinforce, could be a part, I think it's to reinforce the same aspects that the, the students already saw for the, for the monopoly. Okay? So the, the farther we are from the origin, the higher the rent. Mm? They have the slope t minus c divided by d, and they are both in, inward, meaning that as I decrease taxation, I increase my, uh, my duration. By this increase in duration, increases at a decreasing rate. Mm? And finally, if we had a flat, mm, a, a flat line, that would, me, that would imply 
in the ISO range curve with, with no range. Hmm? Okay? So the, 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 the decision that maximizes, hmm, that optimizes the rent, the expected rent for the, for the dictator, it could be the point P where we reach hmm, the tangency between the ISO rent and the duration curve or the farther hmm, ISO rent that is still hmm, feasible given what's the, hmm, the duration curve. And this will occur eh, where the marginal rate of transformation, which is the slope of the duration curve, is equal to the marginal rate of substitution, which is the slope of the highest feasible ISO rent curve. Okay, so the similarities with the with the monopoly are hmm, are clear. So it, uh, that's that's the view. Now, the second thing is let's introduce political competition. Hmm? So let's introduce political competition. So how can we introduce political competition in this model? Well, the, the the argument is that political competition makes the likelihood of losing an election more dependent on the government performance. So what does this mean? It means that now the duration curve is flatter. Because what we have is that, hmm, so what we are saying is the duration changes, so the, the change in the duration when we change the tax, it's higher, but this is actually the inverse of the slope. Hmm? So the slope it becomes flatter. Hmm? So the, the duration curve becomes flatter. Okay? So what we are saying, hmm, and this graph is maybe a little bit too, too small, let me just eh, go to the other side, so hmm, I share both, both screens. Hmm? So we move from this initial uh, duration curve to a flatter duration curve pivoting on the, mm, on the, maximum, on the maximum duration mm, and that would change mm, from point B to point G. Mm. So we go from, from point B to point, to point G. Okay? This is equivalent to change mm, in prices which of course give us the substitution and income effects. Mm, that we can play with them, and we know that when we have substitution and income, and income effects, then the total effect will be mm, unknown. Mm? So duration may increase, duration may decrease, depending on whether the income or substitution effect, uh, whether the, the income effect mm, overcomes the substitution effect or not. Okay? So in this graph, in particular, what they show is we can find a particular case in which duration doesn't change, but just introducing uh, political competition reduces the extractive rent that the that the government uh, that the, that, that in, in this case the the dictator obtains. Now, then we have we have an interesting question, and the question is: Well, could it be? Hmm? So, why a dictator may decide to increase uh, to 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 introduce hmm, democracy or to introduce electoral competition? Actually. Mm? Uh, so, if two conditions happen, so if, mm, so we know that a greater degree of democracy, mm, that's what we just saw, a letter, uh, uh, electoral competition flattens mm, the duration curve, if at the same time we happens that it also makes the, makes the system more, more stable, that means it shifts the duration curve, then it may produce that introducing, uh, introducing uh, democracy, introducing elections, actually increases total range. Mm? So graphically, what it says is, if we, if we mm, so originally we have the, mm, we have the brown, mm, uh, so, sorry, originally we have the orange, okay? So this more vertical, duration curve, if we rotate this curve and then shift it up, mm, and this is one of my, mm, so I'm inserting, mm, so it, it looks a little bit confusing, but that's, uh, I'm doing it on purpose, mm, because I think that's the way it's explained in the book. Mm. So there is never this talk about this pivoting and shift, and that's something that should be, should be incorporated. Mm. So it's, it's interesting that it should be, mm, so if there is these two conditions, if greater democracy flattens and at the same time shifts the, so make it more stable the, the system, then we may, it may happen that these are the original rents, and from these original rents, we may end up having 
higher rents by introducing dictatorship. Uh, sorry, by introducing the, uh, democracy. Okay, if we have these two, hmm? these two conditions, so it may happen. It doesn't need to happen. Okay, so there is a section where they talk about democracy, and I think it's it's very nice this extension. No, it's a, so it's a really uh, expanded version of democracy more than just uh, electoral competition, and in particular, the idea that democracy is characterized uh, by the form of go government with three political institutions. So the rule of law, that means nobody is above the law, civil liberties, free speech, assembly, and the press, and inclusive, fair, and decisive elections, okay? where no major population is excluded from office, and the losing party leaves, mm, and I added peacefully, office. Okay? Mm, I, that's actually, it's, it's part of the definition of Jaworski definition of what is, what is, what is a democracy. Uh, then the two important aspects is that why we want democracy, and this is, mm, again, now we are moving into the normative analysis, mm, why we want democracy. One is because mm, democracy may be mm, the right thing to do mm, in its own. Uh, the other is because democracy may be a good system. Mm, to address national problems, hmm? which basically means to aggregate preferences among people. And the focus on the, on the analysis is really on the idea of, hmm? so let's focus, let's forget, hmm? and that's reflecting what is dominant in the, in the economic analysis, let's forget about one, two, and the idea of democracy, hmm? of the normative uh, side of democracy, let's consider just democracy as electoral competition, mm, fair electoral competition, and as a way of aggregating preferences. Mm. And then we introduce the idea, mm, so how can we describe this democracy focus on this electoral competition? So we have the uh, median voter model. Mm. So the median voter model, what it does is it says, let's, we have a left-right policy dimension, with two parties, the left party and the right party, who only concern on winning votes mm, and winning the election. Voters are uniformly spread on the line, and they vote for the party that is closest to their preferred policy, mm, which is actually Kotlin's model of spatial competition mm, and applied to the, to, to the election. Mm. So the book never talk about Downs, which mm, was the one who, who spread the, uh, the model, because it's true, uh, the model originally was, was in the original uh, paper of, of Kotlin's. But, but the idea of the model, and I think that it's, it's a very nice description of the graph, the idea of the model is, suppose we have this left-right and we have a party who uh, locates mm, here, party A, and then if party B locates at this situation, what we know, mm, at, this, at this location, what we know is that party B will get more than 50% of the electorate, remember, the electorate is, is spread uniformly on this line. Mm? So if party B will get half of the, the vote here, so it will get more than 50%, and actually party B can even do better if it moves much closer because now it's going to get all these voters which are more than the voters that got before. But then party A can react and move to the other side of party B. And now party, B, party A is winning the election. Party B can do the same, so we can keep moving until they are both hmm, close and kind of in the center hmm, of, the political, of the political arena. Once they are here, there is hmm, no incentive for any of them to move, because moving from here hmm, actually will make you lose the election. Okay? So which means, hmm, and this type of describing the, 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 the final situation, it's actually describing an equilibrium. Hmm? So it's a situation where there is no incentive to deviate. Okay? So what it says is that both proposing hmm, policies next to the median voter, hmm, it's, it's this concept of the Nash equilibrium, and it also introduces the idea that the median voter, hmm, it's really a privileged voter, hmm, in the sense that it gets kind of what, what she wants, and at the same time, it becomes a swing voter, it becomes the, the, the voter that mm, all parties want to, want to satisfy, okay? Of course, this is very unrealistic, and the next step is to say, well, can we make it more realistic? Mm? 
well, let's introduce substantial, let's introduce money, let's introduce ideology. Mm? Uh, if we introduce abstention, mm, if we introduce money, uh, and I don't have time to go mm, in detail through all of it because I want to make my comments, or if the distribution of voters is not, uh, is not evenly, what we get is exactly the same result. Mm? We shift where the median voter is, but at the end, the reasoning is exactly, is exactly the same. However, mm, if we combine some of them, if we combine abstention and a not even distribution of voters, eh? and now you will see how poor I do graphs. Mm? So, uh, if we have a no dis a, a, a not even distribution of voters, so this is a polarized mm, distribution of voters on the left and the right, there is basically nobody in the middle. Uh, uh, and mm, so the, the interesting thing, if we have this, and that's kind of the weaknesses, eh, I think, of the, of the median voter, the median voter model would say, the policy they propose is the policy in the middle where nobody exists. Mm? So there is nobody who likes this policy. Mm? It's, it's fairly difficult to believe. But if you combine that with abstention, so median voter would locate both parties there, but if you introduce the idea that if you, put, if you announce policies very far from what, the, from what voters want, you may alienate them and they may not show up in the election, so they may not participate, so you may alienate the big chunk, the big core mm, of, of, of your constituency. If that's the case, then there is a reason for parties to move away and to go to the extremes. Okay? So, making it more realistic, we end up finding something that is also closer, uh, closer to reality. Uh, so, let me, uh, so this is the way to explain this, these two models, so let me just start by, by making my, my comments. Uh, so, my general comment is that I think hmm, I like the, a lot the, the model of the, uh, of the dictator and the relationship hmm, of the dictator with the monopoly. Uh, I was count, counting on having the, the view of the political scientist because I think what it's a little bit missing in this, in this chapter is really a political science view of, 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 of the political process. Hmm? So it's very focused hmm, on, the, on the economist view, which it's always a very simplified view. Hmm? So I always say the same thing. If a political scientist used in a very sophisticated political model a description of the economy as simplistic as we do in an economic model, we would be an outrage. And we would say, these political scientists, they have no idea about economics, Mm, what are they doing? And they are showing something that it doesn't mm, represent the, the economy. So in a way, I think we are doing the same. Mm. Mostly, uh, it's not a problem, of course. I think it's a problem of, of really of the, of the political, political economy approach. But, but in particular in core, I think there is something that is important. And it's that one of the emphasis of core is, is heterogeneity. And here, I think what it's missing is heterogeneity. Mm. And I'll, I'll try to, to, to make my point. Mm. Uh, in a second, okay? Uh, so the first thing with the median voter is that we have hmm, this association of the median voter with the center, okay? Uh, there is no way, you know, there is no, no place in the textbook where we talk about the median voter as really the median voter is the one who splits, hmm, and that's the idea of median, it gets 50% on one side, 50% on the other. Hmm? So the feeling that the students will get is that the median, it's, it's, it's kind of, of the center. Mm? which in, uh, it might be, or it was a good story mm? until probably the 70s mm? or the 80s. Nowadays, it's difficult to think. Uh, so the intuition or the view what we see is that we don't see mm, really locations in the middle. It's, it's more, more extreme positions. So we, we, it could be nice to, to, associate, to associate that. Uh, the other point is, is the idea of these ideological parties who only care about winning. Mm? So it's, it's, it's kind of strange that we have a left party and a right party, and when we make a description, right, so if we go back, if we will make the description, we are saying, and now it turns out that the left party will propose something more to the right than the, left, than, than the right party. Uh, why is that? Can, why can we do this type of analysis? Because they are really not left party and right party. They are people who want to win. Mm? So there is something here 
mm, that doesn't really match. And, and, and as a student, I would be a little bit puzzled mm, about saying, oh, we have the left party and the right party, but it turns out that, that the left party is proposing the right policy. And so it's, mm, why? Well, because we, we want that. The, the interesting thing is that we don't need this in order to reach the median voter. Mm? So if we had really a left party and a right party who only want to uh, implement mm, the policy, and uh, of course uh, we have to assume that they, uh, uh, that the platform, mm, so the credibility of the platform, mm, what they announce they have to implement it, uh, then we would end up in the media. Mm? So it's, it's not necessary that they are the, the winning. Mm? Why? Because once one of them proposes the median, mm, the other one, no matter what it proposes, because mm, it's dominant strategy, the other one will lose the election. So it, it cannot improve the policy. Mm? So you can use mm, ideological parties and, and end up there. And that also will give you, mm, so let's go back. Okay. So that also will give you also the possibility of why we may see this separation. Because you can introduce the story of actually if we are ideological and there is some uncertainty about where is the median, then there may be some separation because I have a trade-off. Hmm? The trade-off is if I move a little bit away from the median, I don't lose for sure because there is uncertainty and I'm proposing something that is closer to my policy. Okay, so there is a way to, to, to explain to students hmm, uh, this, this idea of why parties may propose different things. Uh, the other thing interesting with, with, with the median voter, uh, and, and I think that's a little bit of a conflict in this, in this chapter, is the idea that policy matters, but the median voter says, uh, so sorry, that who is in power matters, but the median voter says who is in power doesn't matter. Right? So, so the whole chapter is about hmm, if women are in power makes a difference, if hmm, uh, Democrats or Republicans are in power that makes a difference, but on the other hand, the type of model we are presenting is a model where it really doesn't matter who's in power because it's the median voter who detects the policy. Uh, I think that uh, has to do a little bit with this, with this I think, of the ideology and mostly with the simplified version of, 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 of politics. Uh, and then the final comment, and I think with that I'm, I, should be, I should be done, uh, it's, it's on, on the advance hmm, of democracy. So the, the story, hmm, so I haven't talked about that, huh, but uh, that, that was part of, so the, the story used in the advance of democracy is this story of uh, we have a ruling elite, and this ruling elite get uh, the demand of democracy from an ever more powerful this franchise group. Okay? Uh, and this idea that the conflict between the rural el elite and the disfranchise, it excludes something, mm, so it's, 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 a possible, it's a possible story, but excludes the possibility of mm, introducing heterogeneity both among the elite and among the disenfranchised. So if you introduce that the elite may not be homogeneous, so if you introduce, going back hmm, to the very beginning, the possibility that I may have an oligarchy, but this oligarchy may have different views on how to use the, the state, then you may end up hmm, with using political competition as a way to maintain some control on who's winning, hmm, as a stability uh, and that could be a good way to make a connection with the description of election as a stabilizing, uh, a stabilizing institution. Mm? So that could create some, it might create some stability in, in the government and mm, could give you another, mm, another possible explanation. So one possibility of why dictators or oligarchs may introduce democracy to compensate. Mm? So one, it could be to compensate the social unrest that increases instability, but the other one is that they may be competing. They may have competing interests. And rather than fighting each other, what we do is we introduce these check and balances, and actually these check and balances may create some alliances between the part of the ruling elite and the disenfranchised, and they may find 
that both they have a coincident interest. And that should be something that they may have good stories of why there are hmm, many cases of extensions of the franchise without really a social conflict. Okay? So, and I think it's, they are not exclusive. So what we are looking is looking at the same issue from two aspects, either from the demand approach, that is from the part of uh, point of view of, of, of social unrest, uh, so for, for the group of, for the disfranchise, and also from a supply ap approach, mm, from the point of view of the, of, of the competing elites. Okay? So just final comments that I actually have, I have made them. So this graph, I think it's, it's interesting to, to place what's the, uh, the description of the, of, of the chapter. So the second is, there is this, and that's the only thing that I think it's missing in, on, on the description of the dictator. So there is no cost of revolution. There is no cost of being dethroned. Mm? So if I get dethroned, it means I don't have more years. Mm? And that, so when I was reading, I was trying to put myself in the, in, in the position of a student, right? So if, if they tell me the story that, you know, I, I get, no, 10 years, and after 10 years I get dethroned, but I don't know, there is no cost. Mm? So it's just the number of years I'm in office that, that matters. It seems that there is, a, there is something, something missing there. Uh, so this, I already said, mm, the idea of, of I think it would be good to emphasize the idea of the difference between pivoting the duration curve and shifting the duration curve. Uh, but I, but I no, like the, I, at, least, at least when I read it, I felt that there was uh, an intention on really separating what is political democracy, uh, what it is political competition from democracy, hmm? which is something that I think it, it's, it's nice to, to emphasize. And those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, I think we'll learn more if you draw out right? what would people like to see in this unit. Good, so we have some time. Have some time for comments. And this, uh, Sam, do you want to sort of summarize? Wendy, Wendy, Wendy has known all of the struggles and ins and outs of this, and maybe we can together work on uh, turning uh, uh, this into a better unit. But in the meantime, I want to say your students are really lucky. <laughs> yes. I mean, what a fantastic teacher you are. Okay. You taught me something about the thing which I wrote. <laughs> I mean, Wendy and I wrote, or I, 10 people wrote, but no. Um, we, we definitely want to take these slides and put them in the collection of slides for teachers, because if these were in the thing and you kind of hadn't had time to prepare your last lecture, well, there you've got it. Yeah, and you hadn't seen our slides because you didn't find the teacher's resources. No. So that was probably extremely lucky. <laughs> I had to make them, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So um, most people, I think, uh, will be unfamiliar with this unit. Is that uh, a reasonable presumption? Anyone has read the unit before? Uh, Stephen, okay, fantastic. And David, actually, David. Um, so I think that uh, what, what we really want to know is from some of you for whom this was your first uh, encounter with this material, is uh, would you teach it? Um, yeah, I'm supposed to. I think they're trying to capture this. Uh, would, would, is this something that you would uh, want to see in the in your classroom? This this might uh, be a question particularly devoted to people who are teaching within a PPE program. So I, I've got the thing. So, uh, so uh, and I know there's a good spread of people here teaching teaching within PPE. So. I think I'd, I'd like to start there and see just if we can get some sort of response of um, of a, a unit which is an unusual thing to find in a in a principal's course. So who who who'd like to lead off? Um, I was thinking of you, Richard. I think as a first kind of introduction and something you could do, I, 
think maybe, you know, it's not even, wouldn't even take whole tutorial, maybe that's only like half an hour. I think the main point, I guess, is that the state is not just this benevolent thing, black box, which just always implements the optical policy. The state is also made up of these rational actors as well. I think that would have, that's really the main point I'm wrapping now, aren't I? But yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. Stephen? Can I just push you a little bit, Stephen, on this? Because the, um, no, 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 no. I don't want to. I'm not being defensive. I'm, I'm literally trying to draw you out because we were talking with Umberto when he raised the normative positive distinction, and I think we need an example. So. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, so to me, I, I think the obsession with democracy is it's, it's too obsessed with democracy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the defining characteristic of the state, which is, is force. That's that's what defines the state: the ability to to to, to force people to do yeah. things, to say, "Give me money, or I'll put you in prison." Do yeah. this, or I'll yeah. put you in prison. Yeah. That defines all states of any kind. The one, the, the central characteristic of the state, um, and then I mean, just simply take that in in isolation, and then and then I would say you can be you can be very normative. You can say, given that, given that particular market niche of the use of force, in normative terms, what objectives can a government engage, what, what niche does that give it in the market economy? And it gives it all sorts of niches. It gives it a niche to, 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 to force people, uh, you to, uh, to in, in, uh, enforce competition laws, to try and deal with externalities, it would otherwise not be, would otherwise not be dealt with because the cozy cooperation doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it allows them to overcome capital market imperfections. It explains why governments can borrow so much more readily than, on much better terms than anybody else can. Um, uh, all sorts of things come from force. No, I, th I think yeah. much comes from democracy. Yeah. I think the yeah. case for democracy is, you know, talk about it by all means, but I mean, look at, the, you look at the massive success of China in the last 30 years. You know, it, 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 it stares you in the face in this context. I mean, and, 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 and you know, yes, we send to point about democracy as a mechanism preventing hunger, preventing, uh, preventing famines, fine, but uh, it, it's the force that the mechanism this is, I think that's extremely helpful. I would give one insight from my students, uh, which, which happened, we have a break after one hour in a two hour lecture. Um, a, and this is the very last lecture of the term. So this, we kind of know each other, it's a big class, but uh, there's a sort of sense of ease. Uh, some students came to see me <clears throat> and they were students from China. And they said, uh, in a, in a sense, they were very polite, but they were kind of conveying what you've said. They were sort of saying, you're disrespecting um, a different kind of political system. So they, so they were kind of picking up. I mean, I don't think we do, but I, they were definitely picking up on, on this kind of underlying uh, uh, orientation towards democracy in that unit. So and I think you know, this is, a, this is a really interesting issue that comes up with such a, um, with, 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 a, with a global project and the fact that we've got the global student population in our classroom. And uh, so I think it's a very interesting and um, telling point. And it's really great to have pinned it down like that. So have we got some, some other, anyone else teaching in a, David, I was wondering what your sense was. I know you haven't taught Unit 22, but David, began as an economist, uh, converted to political science to do a PhD and is now teaching in a political economy department. Uh, well, we don't teach this unit at the moment, although maybe we'll uh, change things in future years. That wasn't a major comment on the quality of the material, uh, which I'd obviously uh, seen some of before, but it was more that because we've got uh, a department of political economy that I work in, we've got economic students, political economy and PPE all in the same lecture uh, taking this course, and a lot of them are going to go on to do a lot of political economy modules in the future, uh, and a lot of them are doing political science modules alongside their economics module. That was part of the reason 
we had to pick four out of the six capstones, and that was one of the reasons we didn't choose this one. Um, so let me just put, tease that out a little bit because I think quite a few people here are teaching in joint degree programs. And one of the typical criticisms, it may not be a criticism in yours, one of the typical criticisms, it's certainly a criticism in yours, is that there's absolutely zero attempt to connect across the three disciplines. So it's as if you're being taught in three different buckets where there's no connection between economics, philosophy and political science. So is that a... Well, our department's kind of set a stall out that, that that's not what we do. Yeah. Uh, at least between politics and economics, and then the philosophy modules are taught by a different department, although there's some interdisciplinary between the two departments. Uh, and so because we do have specific political economy modules, and I'm going to be teaching, for example, a political economy of inequality in the third year uh, from next year, uh, that we're a little bit less open to that than other places, um, but that's by design. Yeah. No, it's interesting, just because... Uh, in a way why we did it was to, to provide a bridge. So it's very interesting if it's seen of, often as perhaps not, either not needing to be one or not being sort of the right kind of bridge. Steffi. Yeah, so I find it fascinating because three years ago I started teaching applied macroeconomics, which is an optional course for third year students in economics. And it's up to the lecturers which topics of applied macroeconomics you can teach. So I picked the topics in equality and institutions and how institutions are now part of this literature of economic, what matters for economic growth. And funny enough, I use the same layout of your presentation, which is not that from the map, and my lecture slides look very similar, completely different, but very similar. And something that I noticed is the first year I said, well, I try, I see how it goes, otherwise I'm going to tell myself you're not doing that anymore, move on. But what happens is that I managed to actually attract a lot of, this is a straight economic, but it's open courses for our joint degrees as well. And the second and the third year, I have a lot of people coming from either our economics and politics degree or our PPE course as well, coming into this course which that kind of took me to kind of try to rebalance the things because the debates were very interesting between straight economic students with this very strong uh, empirical background at Warwick and these PPE students with more political and philosophy things that I kind of, I learned this, a lot of these things by the students when they were discussing and debating these things. Mm -hmm. This material wasn't available three years ago and I said, oh, I'm going to check on that to kind of add it to my, my okay. theory. Okay. <coughs> okay. A any other comments? Judith, did you have a comment yeah, on that? I think it's almost the opposite taking into a, a, a PPE program. It's not where it's appropriate because the other departments will see it as economic imperialism. Uh, and, you know, people remember this phrase. I like economic imperialism. I've got ideas like legitimacy, which is not yet dealt with, by the way. It's taken for granted in the discussion. And you drag them home, right? And, but, 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 in general, it actually is best, this unit, for a different thing, like a, a business school contained economics course, where the students almost have no option in their regulations to take politics or philosophy. And there, it's brilliant, I think. As long as it's clear, it's just a taste. Mm. Because my other concern is that it does not have the degree of scientific status that I believe the rest of the core curriculum correctly has. You notice I've said that. Okay, that is that, that even though I think it's um, uh, only one paradigm, I believe that the rest of it is the dominant one. This is not dominant. This is a view. So it has to be plastered all over it and in with the watermark. A view, see other views, just a taste. Mm -hmm. um, and on the democracy one exactly, um, I actually have an evolving view which has always tormented me because I believe in democracy as a core value and so my analogy is with equity and efficiency that I would love and I take every example where equity is good for efficiency but sometimes it's not and you still want equity and you have to face that. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with democracy, um, I had a student who is now an assistant professor in Sweden um, who uh, in his second year did a quick job uh, econometrically uh, with growth um, uh, continuations. And it turns out that basically uh, in East Asia something is substituting for democracy. Uh, it, it's seen mostly as political contestation. Singapore even mm. has a rather low rating on, on this scale. 
Uh, my own feeling is it's overdue in Singapore, but I believe, as I was once a Trotskyist, that Trotsky had it just right. The wires of bourgeois democracy will not stand too high a social voltage. And so, in some sense, you need the, um, the period when you don't have completely contested elections. And uh, maybe we have it, we're seeing this danger now with populism. That when populism is a serious threat to stability, then maybe it's not right, and we have been pushing democracy too soon. But I still like it as a view. It's very telling, and, and I was very taken by it. If it's stamped, this is one view for other CX, CY. Uh, and, and also that it needs to be separated, almost on a different color of paper. So that it, it is a different color undermine. of paper, actually. Okay, great. So that it doesn't undermine the other discussions that are presented mm. for the rest of it. It's much more experimental, if you like, as a study. Very, that's very helpful as well. Daniel, I wonder if you can come in here. Yeah. Well, I, I completely agree with the point that uh, because I'm going to teach uh, the course of principles based on something of core the economy mainly for students of our business school next year, and it's a very good point that uh, I, probably this will be the only chance for them to discuss these issues because in business school for in our business school there is not a lot of politics political science or philosophy or something like this, so uh, it will be my responsibility to discuss all these things. But I expect that in Russia uh, there will be a lot of discussion in, in, the, in the room because they will raise, they, they will, they will raise hands and uh, say, I don't agree with you because you are disrespecting my father is, a, is, a, is a someone in the government and he mm. says the opposite and our media says the opposite that uh, we, we should have a dictatorship because it's a good thing. Uh, so I, 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 I'm wondering whether I, I will be able to get prepared to this because this will consume time and uh, well th this is, this is the, the challenge that I'm going to face definitely. Well we, we look forward to a report back. Yeah. <laughs> last year and they were working in HSBC in the mm. city. They told me that in their daily work uh, they discovered that politics is extremely important to understand how markets behave, especially if you look at exchange rates and uh, so they told they told me uh, we we have not been told any politics at all and now we discover in our third year how important it is outside for the jobs. Okay, that's very interesting. Great. Uh, how we, Alvin? How are we doing for time? Um, we can take another question if there is one, and then I think we'll have to close. So, I was kind of pushing you along on that sort of line of argument, but people may have had completely different thoughts about how we can uh, improve this unit. Other ideas that you felt were missing. Yes, from the Netherlands. From the Netherlands, twelve points. <laughs> <laughs> I like it a lot, although I go along with, with your criticism on the, essentially the normativity in, in this kind of, um, well, it's not the analysis, it's, it's really the words chosen, right? Before, I guess, well, some of the speakers also said, well, we have a problem with the word market failure and we have a word, problem with the word government failure. And I think we have the same thing here. We don't have a problem with democracy as such, but indeed, you know, it excludes all kinds of other things. Um, so I think it, this can relatively easily be corrected if we are able to find the correct word. And I'm just thinking last five minutes or so, what would it be then as an alternative to democracy or ideal democracy? Um, well, on the one hand, you can have the selfish dictator, and on the other hand, the enlightened dictator, right? But then enlightened dictator, that's not really like democracy. But maybe you can play with that. But that's why the obsession with democracy is misplaced. Exactly. So, yeah, something like that. You know, you have the indeed the nepotism kind of dictatorship, and then you know the cooperative social governance structure that we have in a society, one way or the other. That's not a simple word, of course, but I think we should uh, develop the argument along these lines. This, this strikes me, uh, this kind of normative, positive uh, 
discussion more generally and particularly its application in this unit as a really good thread for a core labs uh, group that we, we could open up. Because I think people have, are going to mull over these ideas and come up with suggestions, so that, that would be very helpful. So I think we should um, thank Umberto once again. Amazing. Um, we've learnt a lot. And thanks, Sam, for stepping in at the last moment. Thank you to Wendy as well for uh, <laughs>